Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Arthur Holland Michel, and I am a senior fellow here at the Carnegie Council, and I am delighted to welcome you to uh, this event, The Technical Limits of AI Ethics. Um, so to get us started, I'll just uh, set the scene a little bit. And um, essentially, uh, this is the goal that we are trying to, uh, to get to with this event. As I'm sure you are all very well aware, over the past few years, there has been a very vigorous debate on what we broadly refer to as AI ethics. And this discourse has been very, very fruitful in producing a range of pretty much universally accepted principles to ensure that AI does not do more harm than good once released into the wild. We have declared, for example, that AI should be fair, that its effect should be spread evenly, that it should be safe, that it shouldn't cause any unintended harm and that it should be transparent, that uh, the, the machinery of AI itself, as well as the structures, societal and organizational to go behind it, uh, we can look into those and, and we can find out how these systems came to be and how they operate. But in a way, coming up with those principles was actually the easy part. It's all very well to say that AI should be ethical, uh, but that declaration, those principles might belie a murkier, perhaps less optimistic technical reality. It's perhaps to offer a, a, a bit of a, a loose analogy, like declaring that the brakes on all cars should never fail, or that ele electrical grids should never go dark. It sounds nice in theory, but there are certain inescapable technical realities that get in the way. And we're here to talk about those realities today. Now, I should say from the outset, the, the title of this event makes it sound like this could be something of a smackdown of AI ethics. And that is by no means the intention here. In, instead, our goal is to develop a more grounded, realistic vision of AI ethics, uh, informed first and foremost by technical fact. And to that end, we are tremendously lucky to have three absolute superstars in the field to help us do just that. Deb Raji is uh, currently a Mozilla fellow, Christian Lum uh, from the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, Zachary Lipton from Carnegie Mellon, all three of whom in their own distinct ways stand at the very forefront of efforts to bridge the gap between the idealism, if you will, of AI ethics and the facts of life. Now, here's a bit of a run of show. We'll have about 45 minutes of panel discussion, followed by open questions from the audience, which you are very welcome to submit through the chat function at absolutely any time. And please bring your questions forward. Uh, do not be shy. Um, we're going to keep this non-technical, uh, but any area of clarification, anything that you're looking for, we are there to, to have a rich conversation around it. I should also say that a transcript and recording of this event will be available on our website, CarnegieCouncil.org, along with an archive from all our previous events and announcements about upcoming events. And a recording will also be available soon on our YouTube channel. So um, before we get in with each of the speakers, I, I'm going to give one small piece of technical clarification here, which is that in terms of AI, what we're largely going to be talking about today is machine learning, a subset of AI that is essentially applying uh, probabilistic models, uh, systems that essentially train themselves on data that we provide in order to achieve a certain desired result. That, is perhaps an oversimplification, but for our purposes, that's what you need to know. And with that in mind, we always start with data, the data that we essentially train machine learning systems on. And with that in mind, I wanna to turn to Christian first to talk a little bit about data. Um, so Christian, uh, first, we hear a lot about notions of data bias 
And I was just wondering if you could first and foremost, just explain to us what is meant by this term data bias and why it's an issue for uh, the ethical application of, uh, of AI or machine learning systems. Yeah, so I think that's exactly the right place to start. And when people talk about data bias, I think different people mean different things. So, you know, my background is in statistics. And as a statistician, when I hear data bias, the first thing I think is representativity or sampling bias or selection bias, which is simply to say is everything in the population you're trying to sample from equally represented in the data. So, you know, to sort of put a technical spin on that, does everything from the population you're interested in have the same probability of ending up in your data set? Um, and there are a lot of reasons why that not, might not happen, right? So one, one example where that condition I, I think isn't met is if you say use a database of, of a police database of crimes to measure all of the crimes that occur, say, in a city. So the population of interest there would be the city and the data would be the police database. Now, if the police are collecting data on these crimes in a way that, for example, is emphasizing enforcement in minority communities, then the crimes that occur in those locations will be more likely to appear in your data set than the crimes that occur elsewhere. So that data would be unrepresentative or would exhibit something like sampling bias. So that's, that's one type of bias, sampling or selection bias. And that's sort of, like I said, the first place I go to as a statistician. Now, there are other types of bias as well, and these might be more what people are thinking about when they are, you know, sort of speaking colloquially about bias and data. So another version of this might be measurement bias. So that, that is to say that the concept or the idea that you're trying to measure, you're systematically measuring it too high or too low using the, with the data that you're actually collecting. And so one example of this might be if you're using teaching evaluations to measure something like teaching effectiveness. So many studies have noted that um, women, for example, are more likely to get negative teaching reviews even when their students are learn the material equally well, right? So in that sense, the, the women in that sample would be sort of systematically measured as worse than the men or other people, um, you know, relative to some other sort of notion of, of the thing you're trying to measure. And this is especially problematic um, when there's this differential measurement bias. So this thing that I just measured here, if everybody's sort of measured too high or a little bit too low, depending on the application area, that might not be you know, that big of a deal. But when you have certain groups who are systematically measured too low relative to other groups, then you can induce real problems in the data. The third type of bias that I think um, we should talk about, and actually I'm gonna talk about a fourth in a second, but the third one that's usually talked about is societal bias. So this is to say, is society representing some sort of bias or is, is society really unfair in some way? So the data you have could really accurately measure reality, but reality is unfair. So for example, you could have a data set that measures, say, the salaries of all the people in a company. And say you have all of those salaries, so we don't have to worry about um, sampling bias. Everything has probability one of, the, of ending up in your data set. You have every single person in that company. Um, and maybe you have an accurate measurement of what everyone's been paid, right? You have access to payroll. You, you have a very accurate reflection of, of the underlying system. But if there is some sort of... Um, unfairness in the way that salaries are awarded in that company, then their data set will actually will reflect that sort of bias, that sort of societal bias. And, and one thing you'll notice in, in all of these cases, or at least in the first two cases, that I'm sort of talking about bias with respect to what. So I've talked about this in the sort of technical and maybe more concrete way of talking about things, like there's some real thing we want to measure, this population is the population of crimes, um, and say the thing we're using to measure it is a police database. So I would say that's a, you know, that exhibits sampling bias with respect to the population of crimes. But if the police are actually accurately recording all of the crimes that they record, I would say that's an unbiased, doesn't reflect sampling bias with respect to the population of things that are policed, right? Or think there are things that police know about. And so in that sense, it's biased with respect to what, right? It's if, if you're talking about the population of crimes, it's biased. If you're talking about the population of Crimes that are enforced by police, it's not, right? When we're talking about this measurement bias, I mentioned the measurement bias with respect to what the students actually learn. So there's a sort of mismatch. When we're talking about societal bias, we even still have that problem. Is it right or is it wrong if there's a despair, say a gender disparity in wages? You know, you know, some people might argue that 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 the, the disparity that we observe is 
is not a problem. In that sense, they might argue that it's not biased. Um, and the last type of bias I, I, I think is bears mentioning, and I think every data set from the beginning of time till the end will exhibit this sort of bias, whether you, know, you can fix those other ones and we can talk about that in a minute, is I don't think there's a great term for this, but feature bias, like what do you actually choose to record, right? When we're talking about something say like, manufacturing errors for screws in a factory you can you know maybe everyone will be in agreement that the right thing to record is the length of the screw and if it deviates by some amount then then there's a problem um, but when we're talking about data about people in particular um there a lot of decisions go into determining which data you're going to to collect how you're going to record it how you're going to measure different things and even if they, the data set you have doesn't doesn't exhibit sampling bias, doesn't exhibit measuring bias, your measurement bias, you're sampling from a world that's totally 100% fair, there's still somebody deciding what things you're going to measure, right? And so that in itself, I think, is, is a form of bias, because that will then determine the uses of the data downstream, the sorts of ways you evaluate that data. You know, we often see that, um, that, that it's, that, that, that in certain situations, people don't want to collect information on sensitive attributes, say race or gender, but that in itself is a decision that makes it difficult to evaluate whether um, you know, your data is, is representative or whether a model you build from that data is, is reflecting some sort of disparity or bias um, with respect to those variables. So all of these are, are different ways we could talk, we could, we could talk about um, bias in a data set. Sure, no, that's that's tremendously helpful uh, as, as an overview. And just to recap, remember when we talk about machine learning systems, the training data that it's fed on really becomes that system's worldview. So if there are inequalities reflected in that data to the machine learning system, not to humanize it too much, those inequalities will just be normal. They'll That will be how the world works as far as they're concerned and they will perpetuate those biases. So with that, in mind, and with particularly this notion that all data sets are going to be biased in one way or another, which I think is a key takeaway for us to think about, that you can't separate non-biased data sets from, from biased data sets along any of these dimensions. Technically speaking, how, how do you root out those bad biases, if you will, the kind of biases that will uh, go against the principle of AI fairness, the, the biases that will cause AI to be unfair. Is there a technical way of finding those those and, and, and doing something about them? So I think it, it sort of goes back to which sort of bias you're concerned about. You know, again, sort of starting where I start as a statistician, let's start talking about sampling or selection bias. You know, there are, there are ways to figure out whether certain groups are over or underrepresented, especially if you have access to some sort of um, ground truth, right? Say you you know who everybody in the full population is. Maybe you have, you know, in sort of, in old school statistics, we talk about, you know, you have the phone book for, for some region. So you know who everybody is in that region. That's probably a little inaccurate. Certainly there are some people who don't appear in the phone book, but let's say that's the population we want to sample from. Um, and say, if you know some characteristics about those people, then um, certainly you can figure out if say, certain types of people are less likely to appear in your data set than others relative to this sort of ground truth to full population that you have. Um, of course, that requires, like I said, access to some kind of ground truth. It ac requires access to sort of covariates or information about those people. So you could see is group A underrepresented relative to group B, but that, that's certainly one thing people do. And, you know, there are statistical solutions to overcoming that sort of bias, like reweighting, for example. So that's one thing you could think about doing. Um, when we're talking about measurement bias, I think it again comes back to really thinking about what the thing you're trying to measure is um, and and determining whether what you have is a, is, a, is a good measurement of that, right? And I think one way you can, I think a good first pass at thinking about that from sort of a technical point of view is looking for disparities that you think shouldn't be there um, in the underlying concept you're trying to measure. So if you do see large disparities, say between genders or between any other number of um, sensitive attributes, that might be a good place to start to try to do maybe a more qualitative analysis of um, you know, how that data is being measured and, and where those sorts of disparities might, might be generated. Um, when, we come, when we come to societal bias, I think Oh gosh, you know, I think, I think, I don't, <laughs> I think that, that, you know, there are statistical methods you can use to, to, to find disparities, to, um, 
you know, see if, if what you're seeing differences between different groups or different individuals are statistically significant. It's not just random chance. But at the end of the day, I think your best bet is a more qualitative approach to understanding where fairness in society lies and how it's generated and how that ends up being encoded in your data. So this to me gives rise to what seems like a bit of a catch-22. You know, if we start with the assumption that all data sets are going to be biased in some way or another and may have, you know, uh, negative biases that we don't want, essentially mitigating those biases is going to depend on very subjective human decisions in one way or another to try and counteract those. But if you're relying on humans, then you are sort of back at the beginning where humans have this capacity potentially for societal bias. And it seems to me like a bit of a circular problem, perhaps, you know, you can't rely purely on the numbers, but you also can't rely purely on the squishy human bits uh, either. Um, it, does, that, does that feel like, I know it doesn't feel like a satisfying way of looking at it, but would you say that is a, a sort of technical inherency that we're just going to have to continue to contend with? I, I understand where you're coming from, and I think I think I think that's I think that's essentially right. Um, you know, the data is always going to reflect somebody's worldview, and so I think the idea that we're going to completely unbiased data in some way is maybe. It, it, I think that's kind of a fool's errand because it's always going to be it's always going to be biased with respect to something. Um, and so I think really the solution, if, if, we're look, if we're going in the direction of solutions and not trying to leave it at this place where we feel like, let's throw our hands up and not do anything, right? Because the data is always going to be biased. You know, like, let's think about what we can do. And I think that's more about awareness, like being very clear about documenting whose worldview is encoded in this data, why decisions were made, what sort of checks were made to verify that, there, that certain disparities aren't there um, that, that might have detrimental effects downstream. Um, but just sort of coming into it with, with the idea that, yeah, that somebody's worldview is going to be encoded, somebody's bias is going to be encoded, it's going to be encoded in some way, and being cognizant and careful with that bias as you move forward and use it for different, for different purposes. Got it. No, that's that's fantastic. And with that, I, I want to move over to, to Zach after that fantastic overview of, of the data set piece. Um, Zach, let's assume that you have a data set that is perfect in every way. And as a result, one might imagine that the machine learning system that you train on that data set is also going to be uh, perfect. As Christian just explained, that's a, a, a pretty uh, lofty assumption. But let's, let's roll with it for a second. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the challenges of what one might call the gap between a, a machine learning system's training data, its worldview, and the real world? You know, you've written about concepts like data shift. Could you explain some of these issues and uh, some examples of what they mean for AI and its applications? Yeah. Um... So I think there's there's a couple of distinctions that need to be made, like from the outset. And um, uh, I think we have a when we use the word AI, which is sort of AI is a sort of aspirational term that refers to a, um, a broad a broader field beyond machine learning of concern, not not necessarily just data driven approaches, but the, the broader field of inquiry of people looking to build systems that sort of reproduce certain like cognitive faculties in, 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 in silico. Um, we, 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 uh, but the technology we're talking about, at least, you know, I think in this conversation is almost all quite narrow, which is we're talking about data-driven systems, so specifically pattern recognition systems. And uh, there's a tendency and it, it, it's hard to avoid it. I think it's hard, even discipline researchers have trouble avoiding it. Uh, undisciplined researchers are all over the map and the, the press is somehow even more ridiculous, but th there's a, a sort of impulse to anthropomorphize. And I think, you know, even here, there's, there's subtle ways we start doing it. We start saying, um, like, uh, there's, I'll, I'll pick on you and uh, I'll Please do. Uh, make a, draw a little contrast. You said, uh, when you have a data set, this is the model's worldview. And uh, what you mean by worldview, I think when you actually, um, Whereas Christian actually said something more subtle that I'm, I'm inclined to consider a slightly more reasonable characterization, which is to say that the data is reflective of somebody's worldview or um, in that somebody's sort of like set of normative commitments and beliefs informed 
like the data that you have. So, so this data is, is, is reflective of, of the decisions that someone has made, which is different when you say like, this is what the data, this is, this is the data you see, like now this, this is a worldview because a worldview is already something a bit anthropomorphic about it. Now, what do we mean by a worldview? And uh, I think we uh, are referring to a, a collection of sort of beliefs or normative commitments or um, the sorts of things that these models don't have sort of, you know, involve sort of structure and assumptions and mechanism uh, about how the world works. And, and, and the model doesn't know anything about how the world works. It doesn't know that the world exists. There's no such thing as a world. Uh, these are, we're talking about pattern recognition systems. So I think like, if you remember like from like high school class or something uh, and you, you, you took some measurements, like you, you turned up the heat and you looked at like the volume of water that evaporated or whatever kind of pattern you were doing. And you kind of like drew a curve to fit it. You're doing the same thing. Like this is almost all the technology we're talking about is just curve fitting. So it doesn't have any worldview. It doesn't know what the temperature is. It doesn't know what volume is. It doesn't know what income is. It doesn't know what race is. It is just uh, you've presented a machine with uh, some data and, and typically the systems that we're actually deploying in the world, almost all of them are coming from this paradigm of, I've collected some uh, um, I, I have some set of examples, we call it a data set of, of inputs and corresponding outputs. Uh, and the idea is that at deployment time, um, sort of for training purposes, you have, you can see both the, the inputs and the sort of the targets and at deployment time, uh, the targets will be unknown. And so you're gonna to wanna to sort of infer something unknown from, from, from something known. Um, so you now like kind of drilling down on this. So before you get to distribution shift, like the, the next step is we say like, we're using, we're using the AI, we're using the machine learning, let's do, you know, um, we're deploying them in the world, you know, and, and, and the first sort of like important elision that happens here is between decisions and predictions. So you have this idea of like, well, if I collected the perfect data, then it will, it will, it will do everything perfectly. The question is like, what is this everything? What is this thing we are asking of the model to do? And the thing we're asking the model almost like there, there are settings where like you just want to make a prediction. Like you are a passive observer to the system. You have negligible ability to influence it, at least in the short run. And so like, uh, like, I don't know, but that's a good example here. Someone, there's no meteorologist in the house, right? So nobody's here to come bullshit on me, but uh, let's <laughs> just say weather forecasting uh, would be maybe such an example where, um, you know, uh, unless you're in like Looney Tunes or like you've, uh, in the future, you probably don't have that much ability to influence the weather just by forecasting it, at least not like the seven day forecast or something. Um, and so like your, your goal is really just to make a prediction. But many of these systems that we're, we're talking about, uh, the goal is actually to guide a decision or the, the, either to make it autonomously or to, to influence a decision-making process. And, and this is not something that necessarily is like, it's not quite clear, you know, um, like, what do you mean if like, you have the data? Like, you, know, you have the perfect data. Um, uh, the, the, the point is that like, what do you do with the data when you have it? You train a predictive model, you do some curve fitting, but that, that, that's, that's, that's an exercise in, in um, prediction, but ultimately what you're now really concerned with principally is the impact of decisions. And, and, and what, what binds the prediction to a decision is often um, just like spit and, uh, you know, mud and like, you know, like whatever, you know, duct tape, uh, and, and so basically like here would be an example. Uh, I want to build uh, a better customer experience for, for, I don't know, I work at Netflix and I want to build better customer experience. So I want to curate engaging content. So how do I do this? Well, um, I go out and collect some data and train, I say machine learning, like AI will do it. So I'll build the AI to do it. So what do I do? I collect data. What data do I have? I have uh, who saw what movie on what day and did they give it a thumbs up? Did they skip it? Did they continue? Whatever. So now I'm going to construct some kind of prediction goal. Like I'm going to say, I want to uh, predict which things people are going to say they like or predict which movies people are likely to click on. You know, like I give examples of movies that were suggested to people. I have ground truth of what was uh, what they clicked on. Uh, and I'm going to try to like train a predictive model. And now the what binds us to that, like the actual decision you want to make is what should I show someone in the future? Um, so like you can start, you, you know, there's the level of like, are there, are there, are there, um, you know, are, are, are certain groups of people overrepresented in the data are, um, uh, there's all, you know, all, you know, are, are, are you sort of, uh, deferring to like the dominant taste of some people and missing out on, you know, um, 
sort of underserving some minority of people uh, because you 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 don't capture in resolution that there are these distinct demographics. There are those problems. There's also the 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 broader problem that people uh, the sort of bigger reckoning that is coming to most of the application of machine learning in the world, which is that so much of it. Uh, that there's there's a pipeline and prediction is part of it. And there's huge problems just with prediction. And I'll get into that. But there's also a part of the pipeline that consists mostly of bullshit. And then this is what's binding the prediction to the, the decisions you're ultimately plan on making. So like, for example, in the recommender system, um, I, I could say now uh, I'm going to try to predict who's going to click on what. You know, I try, try to predict, you know, like among the items that are shown, you know, which, you know, click or no click. And, and I could I could have data, the data could be, comprehensive, the data could be enormous, it could capture data for everyone who's been on the service. What it doesn't tell me is that showing the people the items that they are most likely to click on, given that they were presented to them, according to the previous recommender policy in place, that now choosing those as the items to curate is a sensible way to actually perform curation. And so there's always like when you start talking about, um, you know, uh, any, any of these kinds of decisions, I think you'll always find that there's some kind of loop, you know, where, where there's something missing is I can look at the set of people that were arrested and then try to train some kind of predictive model that's going to try to predict some target of interest. And what, what doesn't tell me is that this is a coherent way of now guiding what sort of decisions the police should be making in the future. Um, and uh, if you don't account for this difference between the prediction and the decision, you could come up with all kinds of behaviors that um, were like, you know, you, yeah, you, you maybe you train a predictive model, maybe you train a predictive model effectively, maybe you train the most effective predictive model that could be trained uh, up to some very small approximation factor given, you know, given the set of inputs you have and the target. What it doesn't tell you is like, what, what actually is the relationship between this prediction that you're making and the actions that it's supposed to guide and the sort of ultimate impact that you hope to have in the world, which is mediated by some kind of real world dynamics, right? So if you uh, say that like, um, you know, based on the features available, you can predict, you know, higher probability of crime for certain individuals, certain that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you have to account for the fact that like, what are you actually planning to do? Are you planning to allocate where police officers should be uh, stationed? And then uh, on the basis of that, you know, if you look for crime, you will find more crime. And so there's this coupling of uh, like a model to a decision to the data that you subsequently see that is almost always completely ignored. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that like that initial level of sort of sobriety of like, not only not like creating the perfect model of the perfect data set, but largely we are engaged in, a, in an extremely ad hoc process of automating, you know, various decisions that really ought to be guided by reasoning um, in a sort of, on, on, on sort of a lark that like prediction is going to do magic and that you know the benefits we get from scale will outweigh the kind of consequences of the sort of doing you know just sort of doing something fundamentally incoherent. And I think you see this all the time. Like uh, YouTube curates uh, videos based on people who like people who like similar content to this. Uh, you know, who are therefore similar to you tended to like this other content that's recommended to you. And that seems great if you're like I like Wolfbeck, and then I see. Uh, you know, nowhere, some other like kind of like, you know, hipster virtuoso band. And I'm like, okay, this is this is something it's this is okay. On the other hand, you have these well documented cases where uh, YouTube is curating playlists of like, uh, like uh, naked baby videos for pedophiles, uh, because well, people who like naked baby videos tend to like uh, other naked baby videos or something like this, you have um, this, this sort of failure to account for, you know, the the actual this enterprise we're engaged in. So, so, so that, that's all about like the everything we're doing is wrong level. Um, now, if you just zoom in on prediction, which is the thing we sort of know how to talk about, even just if you just consider yourself like a passive observer trying to do prediction, um, even then all of our technology is sort of proceeding on a very naive assumption, which is that basically um, uh, uh, you're going to go and there's some, there is some distribution, we call like the distribution, like there actually is this fixed distribution that, you know, God knows, but we don't. And that we have some procedure to collect samples, which are, you know, uh, drawn from this probability distribution. And that the data that we have seen has been collected by drawing a bunch of samples completely independently from this fixed underlying distribution. And then the data that will encounter deployment time will also be created by drawing more examples also independently from the same underlying distribution. 
And the, the, the problem there is that that's just not how the world works. If you train on, a, I don't know, you're trying to train some text classifier based on Twitter data up through 2016, and then you're deploying it on data past 2016, people are talking about different topics. Um, and hopefully again in 2020, we will get to talk about 2021, we'll get to talk about different topics. Um, people will use language differently. There will be slang that wasn't there before. Um, so there will be uh, um, a, a shift in uh, distribution over inputs that we're encountering and it, it's occurring in a, in a kind of haphazard way. You know, stories can, you have like gradual changes in the use of language. You have sudden changes in the sort of like emergence of topics, you know, the fact that like, you know, overnight, everyone's talking about COVID, uh, you know, 20% of the time, which just never happened before March 2020. Um, and, and in these cases, there's a question like, what can we do? How can we make valid predictions? Or how can we how can we have some kind of faith in the reliability of, of the predictive technology that we have, even if we're just focusing on prediction, when we're faced with this kind of dynamic environment? And, and I mean, even in a setting where there's no feedback loop, and we're not worried about decisions. And the answer is that this is in general impossible. So basically, if we assume nothing about the way that the world can change, um, we actually are always acting under some amount of ignorance. If anything could change in any way, there's no reason to believe that the, uh, if we, we can make no assumptions about the way that the historical data is representative of the data that we will see in the future, all bets are off. And, and, and I think, you know, this is something that like, uh, you know, people who um, are, you know, have, uh, argued more informally and at greater length uh, and with more, you know, I don't know, histrionics than me, like, you know, Taleb, you know, you could read whole books about just like our sort of reluctance to accept ignorance and uh, what we what we can't predict. Um, now, there's sort of like two, you know, sort of technically, there's sort of a few different paths forward. And one is that um, we actually can make technical progress on this problem of learning when the the, the, the data distribution is shifting if we can make some assumptions. We don't have to assume that everything's exactly the same or there's some fixed underlying distribution, um, but we can uh, make certain types of assumptions like, okay, um, the uh, frequency of the categories that I'm trying to predict uh, are changing, but uh, what the instances look like, the distribution over instances given the category are, are, are relatively the same. So an example would be like a disease, like say COVID is trending up and down and I might be wanna track, you know, what's the frequency of COVID in the moment and if I believe that what COVID looks like in terms of its manifestation and symptoms is not changing in the short term, but the prevalence or the, the incidence of the disease is changing dramatically in the short term, then I can sort of, using this structural assumption, develop some, you know, reasonably elegant machinery around it to leverage this, this, this invariance, say, okay, now, now I can actually identify this parameter of what is the incidence in the moment. So I can assume this kind of like invariance of a conditional probability, like the symptoms given the disease aren't changing, but the prevalence of the disease is changing. Um, you could also sometimes find scenarios where you could work with the opposite assumption that the distribution over the inputs is changing, but you be, believe that the uh, um, probability of like say the disease given the symptoms is not changing uh, or disease is a bad example, but the, the category given the inputs is not changing. I'd point out though that uh, this requires some prior knowledge. You need to know which assumption applies. And if you make the wrong assumption, you'll come to the wrong conclusions. So this is like a common thread through like causal inference. And I, I know Christian's done a, a lot of uh, great work in applied causal inference in the context of criminal justice. Um, there's sort of a basic tenet that like um, data plus assumptions can lead to sort of causal identification of like parameters of interest, but the data often alone is insufficient to tell you which assumptions are valid. And if you make different assumptions, you'll come to different conclusions. So. These are, might be things you need to experimentally validate. I'll give a, a simple example is people often assume when they deal with data, shifting data distributions that probability of Y given X, the probability of the label given the inputs is not changing. This is invariant. And the easy counter example is imagine that you're looking at symptoms data and you're, the only feature that you have is cough and the, in, the, the label of interest is coronavirus. Um, if you look in uh, December, 2019, probability of coronavirus given cough is about 0%. Now in the future, all that's changed say is the amount of coronavirus, but now probability of coronavirus given cough is, is, is maybe quite high, maybe it's 5% or something. So you get the idea is that um, uh, you, you know, these are very hard problems and you sort of have two worlds. You can, you can make some kind of assumption about like either you know, there's some kind of invariance in the conditional probabilities, or you can assume something about smoothness that the, the distribution is changing, but it's changing only very gradually. 
Um, and I can assume that like between any two nearby time periods, the divergence in the distributions is limited, there's something I could do. Um, then you have the world of deep learning, which some of you might have seen in the world in which I grew up academically, which is the world of training large scale neural networks, which has thrived largely on an ethos of like, try shit and see what happens. And this is very effective when you have just a well-defined supervised learning goal, you assume no distribution shift, and you basically say, hey, I'm gonna get to verify if the model worked on holdout data, so I can license you to just try whatever you want and see if it works. Um, um, and people have tried sort of using that mindset of let's just try stuff and see what it works to approach hard problems of distribution shift. Um, and they'll sort of say, okay, I'll, I, I have domain A and I have domain B and they're sort of different from each other. I'm gonna throw spaghetti at the wall and see what works. The problem here is that, you know, they're trying 9 million methods and they only have like three different data sets. And they realize that now the relevant effective data size is not the number of examples you have in each data set, but the number of instances of shift that you've seen. And just because you find one method that like you trained it on like handwritten digits and then it worked well on like uh, colored handwritten digits doesn't mean that this is gonna work to other kinds of shifts. So I'll leave it there. No, thanks so much, Zach. That, that's a, a tremendously helpful uh, overview. If I can extract from that, perhaps a, a second inescapable technical fact is that necessarily we build AI systems based on the past, assuming that the future will be exactly the same as that past that they have been built upon. And obviously the future is not exactly like the past and systems are just not capable of accommodating to that. And, and so with that, I, I'd, I'd really like to turn to Deb um, because now we, we turn to systems say, once they are perhaps out in the wild or they're about to be out in the wild. And if you think about these serious challenges that Christian and, and Zach have described, um, to what extent can you get ahead of the kind of ethical issues that may arise? Um, you know, can you look at the pipeline of development and identify these kinds of issues and figure out where it's going wrong and perhaps how they can be fixed? Um, yeah, I just wanted to, sorry, go back very quickly to um, something that um, Zach had mentioned, because I think there one challenge of it is that the data of the past doesn't represent the present. But I think something else he also alluded to was that at times the way that we represent problems with the data um, do not actually reflect the kind of problems that we want to solve with the model. Um, and I think that's, this is like a, at the core of a lot of the issues that we see. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention quickly before answering your question, Arthur, sorry to like do sure. it, um, is that, um, so a lot of the work that I do is on algorithmic auditing. So what we're doing is we're kind of assessing uh, models that have already been deployed. And there's a lot of really interesting things that you observe in those kind of situations. One thing being, um, and this is again to sort of Zach and Christian's point, because we often tend to ascribe like human-like characteristics to these models for whatever reason, um, there's this reduced sense of basic responsibility that happens with people that actually build these models. So um, to sort of the theme of this entire workshop around the limits of you know, what kind of ethical expectations we can have for these models. We expect things from these models in the same way we would expect, you know, our child to behave. So we would say, oh yeah, we want you to be, you know, we want the model to be responsible or we want the model to be like transparent or fair, um, not understanding that it's truly the humans making decisions about the model that we want to act responsibly and to adhere to some of these um, ideals. And it doesn't seem like a big deal, except for the fact that, um, you know, you often have, you know, very simple decisions that people are making about the model. So it's the data source, uh, how the data is labeled. To Zach's point earlier around, you know, um, uh, how effective, you know, the, the, the data sets, the training data set sort of reflects the real world problem or decisions, simple decisions about like how the algorithm, which algorithm you're using, um, you know, being, you know, in a typical situation, if you were building a car or building a bridge, you would record these calculations, you would record these decisions, but the engineer doesn't, um, in the like machine learning AI context, the engineer doesn't feel like that's um, under the purview of their responsibility. And um, I, I think Zach also gave a good example too, of in the AI space, you know, we have like three big data sets that represent very specific types of problems and people think 
that's sufficient to warrant, you know, if I do well on this data set, that's enough for me to deploy it in this other situation or this other context. Um, so with the work that we did auditing facial recognition, it was very clear that, first of all, you know, the data sets that we curate as a research community represent a very specific world worldview of the people that created it um, and also very specific biases, but it also demonstrates a high level of neglect, right? People are not doing a good job analyzing the data sets that they're using um, and to, to sort of develop models that they deploy broadly, um, but also they don't even feel a sense of responsibility. They don't feel like it's one of their jobs to pay attention to these decisions and record them and communicate them. Um, so that's been um, a really big challenge. Um, but then to sort of speak to, again, the sort of like title of this workshop or, or conversation, which is sort of how does that affect what we can expect with respect to how, you know, how well these models can adhere to like our ethical expectations as a society. Um, I think it does mean something very interesting where um, I've been recently reading a lot about like, uh, like the automobile industry and how engineering responsibility plays out in that space. And it's really fascinating because, um, you know, if you're uh, designing a car or building a car, um, it's very clear what kind of decisions you're making. Um, so people are very meticulous in terms of how they, you know, they communicate to each other and to the public about the details of the car's design. You know, if you have a car where the brakes don't work, uh, you're able to, uh, you know, understand that that's an error that was made and you understand that it's something that you can fix. Uh, but when someone comes to you and starts talking to you about, you know, oh, you know, cars are inherently awful because they lead to roads that ruin our cities or cars are inherently awful because, um, you know, they cause pollution, people can really differentiate between, oh, you know, this is a type, this is a brand of car or a, a make of a car that has dysfunctional brakes so we can recall the entire make of this car. And they can differentiate that conversation from the conversation of, uh, cars are bad for the planet, so uh, we need to completely reinvent the way that we do cars, or we need to completely get rid of cars. Um, and I feel like in the AI machine learning space, that conversation is not very clear cut. Um, so people will have ethical expectations, um, and this came up a lot with facial recognition, where facial recognition is incredibly harmful when it doesn't work, uh, when it misidentifies someone um, that is a threat to their life. They could be, you know, misidentified, falsely accused, and then falsely arrested. Um, but it's also a huge threat when it does work. There's these huge privacy risks that are inherent to collecting, you know, millions of examples of biometric data and storing it um, in a way that uh, doesn't necessarily always reflect like the highest security <laughs> security standards. Um, and I noticed that so there's certain characteristics of deep learning, you know, the data requirement, the resource requirement, um, uh, you know, just basic characteristics of deep learning models that, you know, Zach and Christian have already mentioned, the inherent bias in the model um, that, are, that are just like, you know, this is the way deep learning works. We, we, right now, we require you to collect all of this information. And I think there's um, this tension that now exists where it's like, if you want to use deep learning today, you'll actually have to contend with the fact that um, you might actually have to, like, it almost, you know, if you want to build a facial recognition system, regardless of whether or not, like, if you value privacy, it's very, it's impossible to build a facial recognition system, a deep learning facial recognition system, because in order to build that, it requires you to violate the privacy of millions of people to collect their biometric data. Or if you want to do it differently, it requires you to completely reinvent the wheel of how it's done. Um, so I think that, like, that distinction between, you um, you know, those really kind of like structural um, inherent issues of, you know, based off of the definition of what the, we say this thing is, uh, you know, there's inherent ethical uh, limitations to it. And that makes it, you know, difficult to adhere to specific, um, specific sort of like ethical expectations or ethical ideals. Like, I think that conversation is something that the field hasn't quite gotten to yet and it might be the it might be because you know we still have a lot of cars that where the brakes don't work we still have a lot of very simple things we're not doing we're not evaluating for performance on different demographic groups um to christian's point earlier you know we're not um even paying attention necessarily to measurement bias and things that we should be paying attention to so it's really easy sometimes to get cut off in the fact that oh we're not even doing these very small things you know, we have so many cars we need to recall. So how can we think about, you know, the environmental impact? 
Um, but I do think that, uh, you know, at some point we'll have to sort of reckon with the reality of, you know, if we want to use this method, there's going to be inherent limitations to it. Um, um, and I think that's where auditing plays a role to, to your actual question now, <laughs> um, where auditing plays a role where with auditing, um, it's it really, I, I think I found that, you know, there's a lot of inherent challenges to auditing, um, like you're alluding to where um, if you're not an internal auditor, it's very difficult to access any information about the system that can kind of inform your understanding of how it works and what those limits actually are. Um, uh, but I think one really good thing about um, auditing or something I personally enjoy about it is that it's a great way to articulate those limitations um, where you can talk about the fact that, uh, you know, uh, here's what the data requirement is for this particular model or here is here are the decisions that were made about this particular model. And it, it makes it easier to sort of have conversations around, um, you know, things like, you know, if you're going to use this particular type of model and apply it to this particular specified context for this particular intended use, um, are those things actually compatible with what you say as an organization or as an individual, your ethical expectations are or your principles are? Um, and, you know, often that's where a lot of these tensions arise and we can kind of see things very visibly of, you know, machine learning is a method where because you're using data rather than explicitly defining rules for prediction, uh, you know, uh, the, the the outcome is going to be inherently cloudy, right? You can't have certain expectations around um, transparency, around uh, interpretability, explainability. It's inherent to the method. Um, and I think that like those kind of conversations um, become really interesting when you say, and you're trying to apply it to a healthcare, a really high risk healthcare you know, context, maybe this is not the compatible method for that particular application. Like Christian's done a lot of great work in the criminal justice context to highlight, you know, um, if you're going to build a model using these particular methods where it's impossible for us to figure out how this result came about, maybe you shouldn't be using it to determine how someone's going to spend the next 25 years of their life. So I, I do think that um, I want to see the field kind of move in that direction. I think that's hopefully where we're going, where we recognize that in some situations, um, it's, you know, there, there's some, I, I guess uh, the way I would frame it is there's some ethical risk in using specific methods and uh, at, at all. And uh, we're beginning to slowly recognize that. Um, and as a result of that, I think there's now a movement or there's now a push to say that there's specific uh, as, as a result of the fact that just by using, by virtue of using deep learning or by virtue of having these big data sets or whatever it may be, however you want to characterize your model, by, you know, by virtue of specific characteristics of your model, you can't use it in particular context. So you can't use the current version we have of it in particular context. And I think audit, audits have done a good job really um, exposing this fact. Um, I guess the last thing I'm going to say is like to speak to distribution shift. Um, you know, something that machine learning models are really sensitive to is distribution shift. And we, I, I think it's kind of a known, um, it's a known challenge in the field to say, you know, my training data has a very specific um, sort of scope of examples. And the real world has like a slightly different scope of examples. Um, and uh, I think the field has come to the point where there's enough evidence to say, yes, this, you know, deep learning is a method that is incredibly sensitive to distribution shift. So my question is, you know, why are we then trying to uh, use deep learning methods in self-driving cars where we know that the distribution shift of the training data is from California and people will drive to Montana? So, um, you know, these are the kind of questions I'm hoping become revealed the more we kind of expose specific products. Um, but also, I do think that, you know, um, it's a much larger conversation than, uh, you know, the brakes don't work and we need to recall this particular make of vehicle. It's like a much larger, um, uh, it's a much larger discussion that I hope we have. Yeah. So I'd, I'd love to ask a follow up on, on some of your fantastic work on the audit process, because to me, this seems like a massively complex challenge. I mean, over the course of the conversation, we've talked about a lot of human decisions that have to get made through the pipeline. And these human decisions have enormous ramifications. And so is the idea with an audit to try and identify and map every single one of those decisions to make sure that they were the right decision? And I mean, presumably 
even for an inside uh, that's going to be hard to do, but from an outside uh, looking in, it's, it's going to be really challenging. Yeah. And that's like one of the big um, challenges with auditing. So auditing is like an attempt to, um, I guess, articulate or, or, or get some sense of either justice or accountability in the sense of we're trying to figure out, you know, what did, what did someone do <laughs> um, that they maybe shouldn't have done or should have done differently in order to protect this particular population we care about. Um, so yeah, I, I think at the heart of it is an attempt to try to map out the decision-making of different stakeholders and map that out to particular outcomes and then map those outcomes out to, you know, the, the um, experience of those that are impacted um, and, and kind of trace this journey um, in an attempt to sort of say like, if, you know, if the impact to the affected population is something like, you know, um, I, I am denied a loan or I can't get access to housing, um, then we can actually trace that to the decision to use this particular data set or to care about this particular feature or um, to characterize the task in this particular way or to use whatever particular algorithm or to evaluate it in this particular way. Like the whole point of the system of auditing is um, to get to accountability, to be able to like bring forth that lawsuit or um, or run that campaign or pull that model off so that it doesn't affect people in the same way. And I think it is really challenging because um, yeah, you're right. There's so many little decisions being made, but even more importantly to my earlier point, because people like to see AI systems as like, their babies, you know, humans, um, they, you know, machine learning engineers do not want to take responsibility. And that's probably been one of the biggest challenges with audit and accountability work is getting people to just write things down um, to just admit to the fact that, you know, they're involved in these very critical decisions. Um, you know, something as simple as data curation or data labeling, these are decisions that, you know, a machine learning engineer is likely involved in or even makes himself or themselves, but because maybe they, or herself, um, but because they might, um, for example, be sourcing the information from the web or from a popular um, discussion forum, the framing of that decision of I'm getting this particular data source um, uh, comes from this place of uh, here's what society is saying, or here's what, you know, here's, I'm just, I'm just sourcing my information from, you know, uh, the way things are, you know, this, this, the sample of society that is presented as this neutral sample, when in reality, like you went on the internet, you found a particular source with a particular perspective, you made a series of decisions on how you would frame the problem, how you would label that data set. Um, so, you know, there's all of these you know, you, you were re actually quite involved in terms of shaping the outcome of what that data was. Um, uh, and I think there's a lack of, a lack of uh, uh, willingness to admit that. I'll say the other thing as well is that, um, like I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, the difference between machine learning and software is that software, you know, if I'm writing a computer program, I am articulating every single step. Um, uh, it's not, not only is the code better written, but I'm also like, you know, very explicit in terms of the steps to get from, uh, you know, input to output. And with a machine learning model, um, those steps are actually defined by the training data. So the way that a mach machine learning works is that training data through examples, um, you know, the steps are inferred. Uh, and that is what will sort of define my output model. Um, so uh, because of that, because it's a data-driven technology um, rather than something that's explicitly defined, that's also another excuse for engineers to walk away from responsibility where <laughs> they don't, they, they feel like, oh, I didn't actually, you know, I'm not actually picking these features to define my output. The model just learned those features. Um, that's actually something I've heard in my ear many times, like, oh, you know, Yes, it's using zip code and that's a proxy for race and it's awfully racist, but it just learned those features. We didn't control it. And it's like, well, who picked the data set that it was trained on? Like, you know, so um, I think a lot of auditing work has now kind of devolved into understanding which humans made certain decisions that resulted in particular outcomes. Um, and then I guess the very, very last thing I'll say is that, um, you know, data itself is another way of like distancing engineers from responsibility where, um, uh, you know, a human, you know, uh, I, I recently had a conversation with a friend about, you know, wh when you're working, if you're a healthcare worker, if you're a teacher or doctor, you know, you're working with 
people directly. So if you're a doctor and you make a mistake, um, you know, you know who that patient is and you see that it's a human and the connection is clear. Whereas um, uh, with machine learning, uh, you know, if you build a model that's sort of systematically oppressing or impacting a particular population, you just see it as a data point, maybe one of a thousand people you're oppressing, which is actually categorically worse, but um, uh, feels much more distant because that person is represented um, you know, digitally in a way that doesn't resonate and in a way that's difficult to grasp. So you don't, you know, people always try to write papers about data science or the machine learning field adopting, you know, ethical codes in the same way like a doctor has ethical codes. But we are so much, you know, we're so much further from the people that we impact than a doctor is from their patient. You know, we don't see anyone's face usually unless you're doing facial recognition, but even in facial recognition, you're seeing a million faces. So you're not, you're not registering that, you know, the 10,000 faces you failed on, um, you know, one of them is a, a father with a family and three kids, you know, that whose life is ruined because of something you built. So that really does affect, um, you know, how responsible or accountable these you know, people feel. So yeah, all of this to say that, yeah, it is a huge challenge um, on one hand to like trace that path, but it's a even bigger challenge, I think, to convince people uh, about their own kind of role in, in things. And um, when we actually try to pursue some level of accountability, um, we often just have to like pull the product off the market in order to get people to stop uh, and reflect a little bit. So with that in mind, um, I'm, I'm going to hold on to you, Deb, and ask you one last question that I'm then going to punt over to uh, Christian and, and Zach in a, a final round robin before we go over to uh, the wonderful questions that have been coming into the audience. And that is that, does, in your opinion, does this all suggest that there are certain applications of machine learning that, at least as the technology stands today and for the foreseeable future, we shouldn't touch, you know, that there are certain things that we just shouldn't get machine learning system to do because given these technical inherencies, there's no fully ethically perfect, if you will, way of doing that. I'd love quickly your thoughts on that and then to get the other two uh, their take on the same question. Yeah, I, I definitely think that there's a lot of premature deployments. Um, like I was mentioning earlier, a lot of our approach to audit work has been just capturing information in terms of like documenting things so that we can communicate amongst ourselves and to the public so the public can actually have a conversation about it. I think one of the big um, uh, challenges or tragedies with a lot of deployed machine learning systems is that they happen without any level of disclosure or consultation with the public. Uh, so there's no opportunity to participate in terms of defining an algorithm that might actually impact your life or affect you in a specific way. So I do think that, um, you know, if we keep thinking about ways to capture information around the decisions being made throughout the whole machine learning development pipeline um, and afterwards, um, and if we can figure out ways to communicate that to the people that are really important, like should be the really important decision makers, like domain experts, you know, or, or the public, um, uh, or government officials or whoever we trust to really understand and evaluate that risk appropriately. Um, I think if we can do a good job with that, um, then those people will be, in, they will be able to sort of say, uh, wait, actually based off of like fundamentally what this is, this is not appropriate for, you know, what we want to do or what, what this uh, decision should be about or the kind of impact this decision will have. Um, and I think that might actually change from institution to institution, like some, schools might really value equity in their admissions process. And as a result of that, you know, if they all get a good sense of what the automatic, you know, admissions filter uh, algorithm is doing, um, you know, some of them might agree with it. Some of them might not agree with it. And that's a conversation that they deserve to have rather than a conversation that is, um, so, or, or a decision that's sort of made for them on behalf of, a, you know, one or two decision makers without any kind of clarity on what's going on. Um, so yeah, I really think it depends on the people impacted. If there's a way for them to have a say, that would be the ideal. No, that's that's a tr tremendously important point. Um, Christian, over to you. Uh, you know, given these technological realities, are there certain applications that we shouldn't touch for the for the time being? I think there are certain ways that certain technologies 
shouldn't be used. And I'll be brief here. I think there are certain ways that certain technologies shouldn't be used unless we have the controls in place to make sure that the technologies aren't used in the ways they shouldn't be, then they shouldn't be built either. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Very succinctly put, I appreciate it. Zach, over to you quickly. Uh, you know, anything that we shouldn't touch given these technological limits? Yeah, um, I think it's a great question. And, um, you know, I've been to some extent like banging on that can for, for a number of years. Um, um, but I, I won't speak as like a, you know, ideologue on the, the Luddite side, but more, more kind of try to give like, um, like to start, I, I would say that part of why it's a great question is because it's often, I think like the overlooked option. Um, so I think the assumption is like, you assume that these tech, these certain decisions are going to be guided by a certain kind of like incoherent technology. And the question is, what is the fix? Right. And versus like, um, is it, is it ready for prime time at all? Um, so I, I think, you know, especially, I think questions where there's a, a matter of, um, a serious concern of like procedural justice are the kinds of things where it seems just totally absurd to me that we're okay using these. Like, um, like um, uh, I, I happen to be a little bit, maybe my sort of ethics on this are, 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 are maybe a bit, um, I don't know if left is the right word, but a bit maybe more aggressive than even concerning technology in that um, I, I don't think that uh, incarcerating people for risk is like fundamentally coherent because, you know, if, if you could go out and look at like the population of people who hasn't committed crimes and say this person has a 5% chance of committing a crime, this person has a 20% chance. And you say on that basis of like my oracular sort of like premonition, I'm going to incarcerate some of these people. You'd say that it's batshit crazy. Um, but somehow like we are willing to entertain the idea that this is a reasonable thing to do the moment they get arrested. So like if they've been arrested, now we're willing to say, okay, we're going to decide. Uh, we presume that they are innocent, but we're going to make this decision. So I think um, now, like you could you could make those decisions not based on some like oracular kind of like likely you could just say just like the gravity of the crime. There are certain ca categories. If someone's been accused of rape, you're not going to release them on bail just at all, and not because of the likelihood, but because of the seriousness of the offense or something. I see a more coherent route to that. So I, I do think that it's an overlooked option and that in many of these cases, you know, I, I think it should be on the table. Like, you know, when, um, you know, like I just don't think these systems do anything that is procedurally just. And if it's a setting where like that's a requirement, I think it should be off the table. At least this generation of technologies. Um, that no, said, I, I, I think there is an interesting counter argument that is like a familiar counter argument that comes up and, and the counter argument is well, uh, the relevant comparison should be to the status quo and judges are effed up in all these different ways and look at these data. Um, and and it's, 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 I actually think it's, it's not a trivial counter argument. It's something that should be taken seriously. Like you could imagine a world where this technology would be half-baked and awful and whatever, and it would still result in say 50% lower arrest rates among say, you know, or like over arrest rates for blacks versus whites or something that this would be like, hard to just completely rule out that that you could imagine a system that is constitutionally messed up but has significantly less disparity than the status quo um i think someone like christian is um you know maybe better positioned to like do the analysis on actual criminology data to, to sort of say whether there's any evidence to believe that that's actually the case but it's like something reasonable that you can enter imagine um, and then I think there's like sort of a counter counter argument that then comes up often, which also needs to be considered. And I think that that is that even if it's a little bit better, there are other costs associated with automation. And I think one of them is the sort of abdication of responsibility. So I think once you say I'm okay, just sort of licensing these decisions, like, re like removing the sort of individual accountability of like, you know, like there's, there's, a, there's a process by which you could say, I think these judges are doing things wrong and I'm gonna appeal their decisions, or I think this police department is doing something wrong. Um, and, and, and the law plays in this sort of murky space where you can go, you know, air and re-air these cases over generations. People can, there's, there's a process for sort of like 
um, revisiting sort of like judicial opinion on these things and re-legislating these issues where I think there's a worry that once you sort of just say, okay, this is the system and it's like, whatever is the equivalent of like FDA approved to make all these decisions. Now it's like, it, it maybe removes this sort of like important incremental process for challenging the, the system. And so, so I think, you know, I'd say like the, the, the TLDR is like, yes, but it's complicated. Can I jump in really quick? I want to add one thing to that. Of course, I Christian. The, I think the question of, you know, is it bad, but better than humans? Like Zach said, always comes up and that, and I think it's a relevant thing to ask, but I think it misses the possibility of other interventions, right? It sort of presupposes that there's two possible states, the status quo or adding on top of the status quo, this, this particular technology or a similar technology or, you know, some sort of predictive based technology that's, you know, be, being deliberated. Um, but in fact, there are many other possibilities one could consider, right? You could consider policy changes. You could consider new laws. You could consider any number of different changes that might be better than both of those scenarios that come with, with fewer downsides, some of, some of which Zach enumerated just now. And so that's always where I go when that comes up. Like, this is bad, but it's better than humans. Yes, but what's better than both, right? Like, like let's not limit ourselves in the scope of possibilities here. We're, you know, for humans, we're creative. We, we, there, there are all sorts of levers for us to pull. There's all sorts of options at our disposal. Let's not just assume that a predictive model is the only option relative to the status quo. There are many other options we could consider. Yeah. Perhaps and, we could be able, oh. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, that's a great point. Cause I, I remember um, like uh, November 3rd, there was a, one of the proposals on the like California ballot was something like that. It was like cash bail, like abolish cash bail or install a predictive policing algorithm. Um, uh, kind of setting that, setting up that false dichotomy between these two things of like, we have to do things the way they are or we have to use this machine learning model to solve all of our problems when there's like actually a full range of, of possibilities. Um, the other thing I was gonna add though was um, actually I do think that there are certain situations where like deep learning <laughs> um, is like completely unacceptable. Um, like I think that like this current trend that we see of sort of uh, you know, these data-driven technologies that just require an insane amount of data. Like, I think that there's some situations where that's just never going to be okay, where um, the privacy risk is too much and it's just completely inappropriate. So like facial recognition being one of those where, um, you know, to collect all the information, the face data that you need uh, in order to build those systems, uh, you know, requires a lot of faith in whichever authority figure happens to be controlling that data and how securely they're going to control it and, um, you know, and it's just such such sensitive information to to gather on mass for the sake of a technology that hasn't really proven itself yet. That um, I would say that's one of those situations where um, like I I don't feel uh, I, I'm not disheartened when it gets banned. You know, it, it makes a lot of sense to me to, to to move away from that direction. I think there's a lot of more ambiguous cases of that though. Uh, like I see a lot of this situation in healthcare of people collecting a lot of really private information for the sake of healthcare applications. And that's a little bit more of an ambiguous case where we're not sure if the, you know, the, the, the payout of that is gonna actually play out um, uh, and it becomes a much more nuanced conversation. So I'm not sure if that's like a hard and fast rule, but there are certain situations, especially in the surveillance context where um, uh, it makes a lot of sense to just step away from machine learning methods or automated me uh, methods for that. No, that's, that's an important point to add. I appreciate it, Deb. So I'd like now to turn to uh, some of our fantastic uh, questions in the last sort of 17 minutes or so that we have. And I'd like to start with uh, a, a question from Joanna Bryson, who we're lucky enough to have joining us today. Uh, Joanna asks, um, to assure people don't do harm with uh, AI, one thing we've agreed is to talk about AI as human-centered not as a technical system that is, and I take full blame for this verbiage, released into the wild, um, rather than the property of its developer, owner, or operator. And, and I'd, I'd love the panelists' perspective on this notion of, you know, if you will, having a human in the loop and whether that mitigates some of the considerations, the technical limitations that we've been talking about. I can give like a very short, you know, 
I think there's a little bit of a word game here in that there's just a question of what are we characterizing? Uh, there's a question of what is the way we, I, I agree with Joanna um, uh, uh, from like a research perspective about like uh, adopting a posture towards like how we think about these systems in developing them. Um, like what, what should be the aspirational way we characterize them? And I very much just sort of like work in and support that sort of human centered sort of focus but at the same time, I think there's, there's a question of, there's also just sort of characterizing the systems as they exist and what is the sort of status quo, which I think is largely technology developed in a sandbox, not in a human centered way. And because of that, in a sense, released into the wild, uh, you know, often with, um, you know, then to be sort of, uh, you know, some embarrassing consequences. So I just think it's a question of, are, are you describing like the way we should think about the sort of aspirational goals of the field and conceive of like our mission, or are you kind of characterizing what people are actually doing uh, for the purpose of criticizing its weaknesses? And I don't think that those are incompatible. There's a there's like a popular misconception in like the machine learning field. I, f I find of like you know the the bigger you can make the sound the sandbox, you know the closer you are to making it an open problem. Like if I can make this a bigger and bigger closed problem, then it magically transforms into an open problem. Um, and I find that to be like completely um, untrue. Like a lot of times, you know, just um, making it a bigger sandbox does help in terms of it becomes more difficult to identify that failure mode or that situation where um, it won't work. Um, but it's still a closed problem. Um, and I think that um, that's something that the field probably will, is, is in the process of kind of realizing with this very kind of recent wave of work, looking at how sensitive these machine learning models are to distribution shift. Yeah, so I think, you know, the question about whether having a human in the loop or a human is sort of a, an ultimate backstop, right? I think that, that, often gets used as sort of an excuse to absolve the, the makers of the model from responsibility for making sure that the combination of human and model are behaving in a way that's that's more fair. And I think the idea there, or at least implicitly, what's being suggested is that as long as there's a human who's ultimately making the decision, well, then, you know, it's not the model. The model is just providing additional information. If the human, you know, goes and makes some sort of bad or unfair or, um, you know, biased in whatever sense of the word you mean that decision, well, that's ultimately on the human. But I think, you know, there are cases where the combination of human and model ends up being worse, right? And so having that human backstop actually doesn't fix the problem and actually having that model in combination with the human seems to make things worse in some in some way. And so one example I can think of of this was this great study by Alex Albright. Most of my work is in the criminal justice system um, and, and, and her work is, is in that domain as well. And she looked at how judicial decision making changed after um, the introduction of a new risk assessment model. So a new tool that predicted recidivism risk and, and a variety of other risks. And I don't want to, I, sh I should have studied up. I wasn't anticipating talking about this. I don't want to mischaracterize her study. You should go look for it yourself if you're interested. But, you know, my takeaway from this was that prior to the introduction of the tool, um, judges were making decisions for people who had, who were similarly risky by, by the sort of metrics of the tool. There weren't huge discrepancies by race. But then after the introduction of the tool and that risk score was actually explicitly shown to the judges, you end up seeing this split where judges are more likely to give the benefit of the doubt to um, white defendants than the non-white defendants. So, so, so whereas before the model was there, there was some sort of similarity and some, some kind of parity in terms of um, you know, how decisions were being made, the introduction of this additional information um, seems to have caused this sort of split where um, where they started making decisions differently by race. And so, you know, I think I think that's one example. Is the maker of the model absolved from responsibility because because they're ultimately a human there? I don't I don't I don't really think so. You know, it it it, it seems fairly clear to me that it's the combination that's causing this particular problem. And so, um, yeah, I, I think it's more complicated than than just thinking that because this is only a suggestion or a recommendation um, that having the human backstop there is going to solve all of our problems. Another oh, like, nice. oh, sorry. Another quick comment about human in the loop too, is that um, human in the loop is, you know, optimizing for performance on an objective that's been fixed by, you know, um, you know, either the engineers or the researchers, like those that have built the model. 
Um, and I find that that's also, you know, that's to speak to like the lack of responsibility, that's a huge sort of, um, uh, they're not necessarily giving up any agency by introducing humans in the loop. It's sort of introducing humans for the sake of improving or optimizing performance on an objective that they've they've already defined and already clarified rather than uh, inviting humans to shape the objective of the model or better characterize that task um, like was mentioned earlier to to relate to you know more domain specific considerations and things like that so I do think that um, yeah for that reason also I'm quite skeptical of human loop for the same reason. Um I want to make sure that we at least have a chance to ask the the slew of fantastic questions that just came in in the, in the 10 or so minutes that we have left. I'm going to ask these questions together and then um, you can sort of pick and choose as to which uh, you would like to address again in these last few minutes that we have. Um, Lightning round. Uh, exactly. So a question from uh, Renato Vaccaro that comes in is, if we think that multidisciplinary teams with different backgrounds could help in uh, reducing some of these issues that we've been talking about in regards to, for example, bias. A question from uh, Raja Chatila. Uh, he asks, if you think that AI systems should be banned from certain applications, how can we convince legislators uh, to do exactly that? Uh, Clarence Oko asks about this notion of whether we should have strict product liability uh, in the design and development of AI and tech, a strict liability regime in the same way that a person who has a dangerous animal is liable for anything that that animal does. Um, again, I'm gonna run through these just to make sure that we have uh, everything. Um, and then another question from Rajana, uh, Raja Chatila. Uh, when we say that a human in the looper is in control over these systems, we forget how humans might be drawn to still trust the system, this notion of automation of bias. And so he asks about the kind of me governance mechanisms that should be in place to avoid that. So I just ask each of you to uh, pick you know, one thread there, uh, give us a couple of minutes on it and any concluding thoughts that you might have. Yeah, I think it's closer to product liability than strict liability um, in the sense of like, it's not an animal, it's not a person, it's not your child. It's a product, someone made decisions and created it. It's, an technolo it's like a technological artifact. It's a built artifact. Um, so yeah, I think uh, like the framing of like consumer protection and product liability is much more appropriate than um, other forms. I've heard of strict liability. Also people sort of talk about it in terms of guardianship. And I think that's that's speaking about you know a technological artifact in the way you would speak about a human or an animal and it doesn't feel appropriate. I'm going to take one of the questions that I saw pop up earlier. I don't think it was one of the ones you mentioned, so I'm gonna- uh... By all means, yes. Okay, so, so one of the questions I saw in here um, was about whether it is a good thing. So do you guys think that multidisciplinary teams with different backgrounds could help reducing bias? This came from Renato Vaccaro. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, that was one of the ones I wanted to mention because I usually tell, you know, I answer these things with stories. So I have another story for this. And I think it's essentially necessary, but not sufficient. So by that, I mean, like, if you, I think you do need a variety of backgrounds and overuse the word worldviews in the room to spot potential bias, to spot potential impacts um, that others might overlook if they don't have that sort of experience. But just having people there to point this out isn't enough. I think you need some sort of balance of power because the decisions that are ultimately made are going to be are going to reflect sort of the power structures of the people in the room. And so one example I have from this um, again comes from the criminal justice context, and it has to do with the redesign of a risk assessment tool. And you know there are a variety of stakeholders in the room who were consulted about um, different ways that the tool could be built so it would operate in a way that was more fair. You know many different opinions went into this. All these different opinions were heard. I actually thought the process was really fantastic, but then at the end of the day, um, essentially it was the judges who, who made the final call. So despite there being a variety of different um, dissenting opinions about, about certain, I, I can't say the particulars here, but you know, certain decisions about how this thing should be deployed, uh, you know, the judges had the power in the sense that they were just saying, you know, it, it wouldn't be used if it, if, if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't follow X, Y, and Z. And so X, Y, and Z is what happened, right? And so, 
Yes, I think the process is improved by having multiple points of view and, and a diversity of backgrounds, opinions, um, demographics, even at, at the table. But ultimately, if those, if all those categories aren't equally empowered to make the decision, I don't think at the end of the day it's going to make a whole lot of difference. Zach, did you want to take a stab at anything or offer a final concluding thought? Yeah, I'll just very, very lightly. Um, I, I'm going to punt on a couple of the questions. I'm just going to take on one um, or two. But okay, one is this question about like, uh, what about multidisciplinary teams? And on, on sort of one hand, um, I am like, uh, you know, I, like militantly interdisciplinary. So like I, I'm, I'm all for it, um, but I, I would, I would be careful that I think that there is a, a like I, I, I put a, maybe I'm more like anti-disciplinary than multidisciplinary um, in that I don't think the disciplinary, the, I don't think that disciplines are first class citizens in academic discourse. And I, I just absolutely, you know, I, I think it's usually like a, a, a weak fallback that people have of like, well, you know, you're a theory guy, or you're a application guy, or you're a CS guy is like this. And it's only, um, I, I think we, whenever we attribute almost anything to, to the discipline itself as like an intrinsic factor, we are making some kind of horrible mistake. And I think it's one thing to be like, okay, this is a, this is a group of people who have figured out some class of technical things, like, you know, a likely source to look for trying to find the sort of paper you're looking for on some specific question. But like, I guess like I, I do encounter this a bit where there's, you know, what I caution against is there's a kind of lazy multidisciplinarity where people are almost like act like, oh, well, you just need more HCI people or something. You just need more whatever, like that's gonna magically solve things. Um, and the answer is almost like, like, like uh, you know, I think that's almost always like sort of naive. And that the answer is like, uh, Nobody has the answers to the questions we have. They're, they're hard questions. Um, there's not a particular disciplinary bent or um, uh, sort of like pile of knowledge that has some kind of like sovereign right to tackle these questions. And I think there are, there are multiple sort of bodies of literature that bear on it. But in general, like you know, uh, I, I don't think that there's there's any magic bullet. I think we all have to sort of um, have the humility to like, uh, if we're interested in these problems, to follow them where they go. And that, that means getting the, the relevant people with uh, the right expertise to collaborate with and, 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 and acquiring the right expertise yourself, um, whether or not it's maybe the, the thing that is emphasized by, you know, I think that there are examples of like, you know, there's like theorists who try to go on questions of fairness, but they're not necessarily so committed to justice. They're more concerned with proving theorems. And if it turns out that like addressing the problem that ostensibly motivates their work doesn't involve doing lots of theory, then at some point they're like, they get bored. It's like, you know, and so, you know, I, I think that's that's sort of like high level, my my sort of position on it is like, uh, you, ha you have to attack the problem and that, you know, in involves things that, you know, we think associate with different disciplines, but I don't think there's like a magic bullet of like, you know, I think the right people are already in the room and the people who have a tendency to collaborate across disciplinary boundaries are already doing it. It's just um, the, the much lighter answer I'd give is this, this thing about liability. Um, I, I think thinking about who, you know, where, 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 the, where the buck stops or whatever is, is an important and interesting question. Um, it's not always obvious um, who that is. Like, uh, I think increasingly at this landscape where um, people provide data to people who develop models as services to people who commercialize them, um, where then there's individual agents who are accessing them. So an example would be like, you know, there's the ImageNet data set or there's some large like base data set, you know, it's given to a company like Google or Amazon or Facebook or whatever, who's developing a system um, that they're making available through some platform. There's some company who licenses the technology, then they have some individual uh, people who are making decisions that are based on the technology. And it's, um, I, I do think that it's, it's not a totally trivial question to answer like who's responsible for what, like is the person who builds a data set responsible for every uh, technology that's based on it or are they just responsible for providing an honest accounting of what the data set consists of and you know, what it may 
or may not be appropriate for, but beyond that, like, or is the person who builds the model? I, I, I do think those, those questions are not always straightforward to resolve. And I think this is largely, uh, you know, the, the law is concerned with uh, holding people accountable for the decisions they made. And if we're gonna make decisions in sort of fundamentally different ways, uh, then maybe we historically have in some of these regimes, we're gonna have to, you know, the, 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 this is what the law does. Like people, people are gonna have to kind of tease out how, how we, I, I don't think there's, it's not immediately clear to someone like what what the right protocol is or or how to how to sort of formalize these chains of accountability. But it, it's definitely like I think one of the right questions and something we do need to be thinking about. So you know I'm sure there are many many more questions, but unfortunately uh, our time is up. That is all we have time for today. Ordinarily, in a traditional Carnegie Council event in the before times in in New York City, this is when we would have all uh, retreated to the real event, the cocktail hour, uh, but sadly uh, we will have to contend with, I hope, continuing this conversation at least in the online format until such a time arises as we can do, uh, do some of these dialogues in person as they so desperately need to be done. Um, I just want to thank all of our, our panelists today. Thank you so much for your fantastic interventions. I encourage everybody to closely track their work. They are doing some truly, truly important uh, projects in this space. And um, we have a lot to be grateful for them in terms of moving the conversation forward. Um, I would like to also remind you uh, just once again that a full recording and transcript of this event will be available shortly on our website, carnegiecouncil.org, and a recording will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, with that, I will close up. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. I hope you have enjoyed this conversation as much as I certainly have. And uh, let's look forward to continuing the, the conversation. There's clearly no easy answers here. Um, and that's why it takes the participation of everybody to try our best to move things forward. On that note, I will wish you all a wonderful rest of the day. And until next time, signing off. Thanks so much. Thanks, yeah. Arthur, for, uh, for hurting us. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to see you all. Yeah, good to see you guys.